Good evening. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see such a great turnout tonight. My name is Linda Bridwell. I'm the Executive Director at the Kentucky Public Service Commission. So welcome to our meeting about case number 2022-00402. So what we're going to do tonight, and I'm gonna go through kind of a process, and then we're gonna have a couple other speakers from the commission staff, and um, then we will allow you all to ask questions as long as they're not about the substance of the case, if they're about the process or how you can find out more information, we will be happy to answer them. Then once we get all the questions answered um, that we can, we will go into the public comment period. And at that point, then um, I need to make sure that everybody understands and we'll remind you again that our three commissioners are here tonight. They serve um, at the behest of the governor and they are here to listen to your public comments. And they will not be able to ask, answer any questions that you may ask. If, if you ask them, they certainly, it might be something they wanna raise in the case, but it's not a, a discussion period. It is a, it's an opportunity to hear from the public about the case. So Nancy, if you'll, um, the slide, I'll, I'll just go through that again. So the presentation is from the Public Service Commission staff. So this is the opportunity to hear details about the process, the proceeding. We will give you just a high level what this case is about, but we just because this case is in front of the staff right now, we are, we, we are looking through it, analyzing it. There are parties on either side, so we cannot answer questions about the substance of the case. But we will tell you how, if you are interested, how you can find out more about the case itself. Um, so then this is then we'll have a question and answer period and then we will go into the public comment and the commissioners will invite the public to come up make the public comments um, i want to talk a little bit about the public comments this is not your only opportunity so if you are here tonight because you thought this was gonna be a presentation about what this case is about, or if you wanted to know what's being proposed and you didn't understand that that's not really what this case is about, and you wanna go learn more about it, you can enter public comments online. You can get on, um, we will have four public comment meetings and they, all of the public comments will be filed in the record. So Nancy, if you'll, the next, so, just to give you a little bit of an idea, the Public Service Commission it was created in 1934. As I mentioned, we have three commissioners. They are a three-member quasi-judicial body. So they are appointed by the governor to serve four-year terms. They are in charge of regulating the rates and service of all of the uh, utilities within the state of Kentucky, except for municipal utilities. So any investor owned, any water district, water association, that's what the commissioners are regulating. We have over 1,100 utilities in the state of Kentucky um, that we regulate. Most of them are small water districts, water associations, uh, tele, uh, a few telephone cooperatives, those sort of things. Um, so there are 23 electric utilities that we regulate. Um, we are funded by an assessment on all utilities that is paid on their annual gross revenues. And our charge from the legislature is that every utility shall furnish adequate, efficient, and reasonable service at a fair, just, and reasonable rate. So that's what we're focusing on. So again, um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues here, and if you wanna go to the next slide, they will talk about what the, the case, the process, the legal basis of the case, and a little bit about what's going to be discuss during the case and what you can, what the charge is from the legislature. But I do want to emphasize that there are a series of four public meetings. We had one on Monday night in Lexington. We had, um, I don't think we had this big of a crowd in Lexington, but we had an opportunity there to take public comment. If you are interested, the video from that public comment period is online in the case record. All of the, then we have this one tonight. We have two more public comment periods that uh, meetings, one will be in uh, Louisville and one will be in Madisonville, Kentucky. And then we will have a virtual public comment period uh, that you can register, you can speak at that if you would like to. In addition to that, at any time, you can mail us public comments. You can go online and fill out a form and the case number and you can type in public comments. Um, and that will go into the record. 
all of the videos of the public comment meetings will be available during the case record. So I don't want anybody to think if you're sitting there and you're not sure if you want to speak or not, this is not your only opportunity. This is an opportunity for us to hear from the public tonight, but we're trying to be as transparent as possible, give people the opportunity to talk, and then at, um, but we will have other periods where you'll be able to speak either in person or online. Then once we start the hearing, there will be an evidentiary hearing in this case, and on the first day of the hearing, you, you again will have an opportunity to present public comment on the very first day before the hearing starts. Um, it will be either in person or online again. At, at that time so and we'll go through that again after we talk a little bit about the case but I just wanted to make sure that I emphasize that so with that I'm going to introduce Nancy Vinsel who she's our general counsel and she's going to talk a little bit about the legal process hi good evening I'm going to try to be juggling a little bit here so I apologize for that what this is in this case we've got electric generation retirement and replacement. This is a legal process. It's governed by statutes and regulations. The process itself is fairly straightforward. A utility files an application and it includes written testimony and certain evidence in support of the application. Other persons may intervene, and in this case, we have a substantial number of intervening parties representing a variety of interests. The parties respond to what we call requests for information, where the staff and different parties ask questions about other parties or the applicant. As Linda just mentioned, we'll have an evidentiary hearing where there'll be cross-examination of witnesses. Uh, that is scheduled to begin on August 22nd, and it is streamed uh, from our PSC website. I'll touch base on that in a moment. Parties can file briefs after the hearing. There's going to be a final order deciding this matter. In this case, the final order will be issued on or before November 6th of this year. And as Linda said, public comments can be filed at any time during this. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I think I'm moving my mic a little too much. Let me start with the first piece generation retirement, closing electric generating facilities, fossil fuel electric generating facilities. There was a newly enacted law from this last legislative session. It went into effect March 29th, 2023. Part of that law has a requirement that the case is processed within 180 days, six months. It may not sound you know, like it's a short period of time, but given all the information we need to gather, it makes sure that we keep moving this case along quickly. One of the key things to know in terms of the legal status and standard, the statute created a rebuttable presumption against the retirement of fossil fuel filed generating facilities unless the utility provided substantial evidence. What evidence? And it's not just that the utility files this evidence, it's that the commission has to review it and find that it was substantial evidence. There, this particular side has three main components. That the replacement generation is dispatchable, maintains or improves reliability and resilience of the electric transmission grid, and maintains minimum reserve capacity established by the utilities reliability coordinator. What does that mean? Dispatchable, that's one of the issues in this case, so I, I can't go too deep into it, but just think of a, basically an adjustment in output from a facility. Reliability, that is nicely defined in the statute. And I'm sorry, I want to double check my notes so I make sure I get this correct. Um, reliability is basically that there's adequate capacity to deliver electricity to a utility customer when the customer is demanding it. Resilience 
is that a utility or the facility can quickly respond to events that compromise reliability. Minimum reserve capacity, what that is, it, it's basically it's a cushion of excess electricity beyond a pink demand. Think of it like a savings account to make sure that there is this additional electricity to be called on when it's needed. The utilities reliability coordinator is not the Public Service Commission. It's an organization called CERC, part of a national network that responds to a federal, that is overseen in part by a federal agency. The other requirements from this statute that no net incremental cost recovered from ratepayers that could be avoided by continuing to operate that facility in compliance with applicable law. The decision to retire the fossil fuel generating unit is not the result of a federal agency financial incentives or, bon or benefits and that the utility must provide evidence of all known direct and indirect costs of retiring the unit and demonstrate that, the, that cost savings will result from the retirement. The next piece is if you retire something that's providing electricity, what are you gonna replace it with? The commission has, a, there's a separate uh, statute for replacement generation. A utility must obtain prior approval from the commission before building any replacement generation to furnish electric service to customers. It's called a certificate of public convenience and conven public need and convenience or CPCN. I'm so used to calling it a CPCN, it takes me a minute to spell it out. There are two things a utility definitely must show to get a CPCN. A need for the generation and a lack of wasteful duplication of facility, if the facilities are constructed. That application is evaluated in terms of long-term costs and benefit. And that's because utilities have a statutory obligation to provide adequate service to their customers. One piece of the providing adequate service is prudent investment in the facilities when we're looking at a CPCN, we're looking at it in terms of a utility's future recovery of reasonable costs associated with the project. So we're not just looking, oh, do they need this? We're considering the economic piece. Let me break, break this down a little further in terms of need. Need is definitely that there's a need for that facility to provide adequate service. The utility has to show that without this facility, there will be inadequate service, substantial inadequate service, that the proposed facility is economically feasible, and that the utility considered a range of reasonable options for meeting that need. Now that second prong, wasteful duplication, there's some overlap there too. The utility has to demonstrate that if that CPCN is granted, the facilities will not result in wasteful duplication, meaning there's no excess of investment in relation to need. The utility has to demonstrate that reasonable alternatives have been analyzed. Those alternatives have to be real, not just hypothetical, but real, really digging in and looking at what options are. But reasonable is the key. A proposal that costs more than an alternative does not necessarily result in wasteful duplication. And if you'll give me my indulgence, that's kind of a hard concept sometime. I always use the example, I live 45 miles from work. The least cost alternative for me to get to work is to walk to work. But that's not reasonable in terms of time. So that's a pretty extreme example, but that's what we're looking at when we're looking at the reasonable alternatives. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, William Coston, who's our Director of Financial Analysis. Thank you, Nancy. Well, thank you. I'm, again, I'm Trip Coston, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about, at a high level, um, kind of the, 
the proposal that the company has presented for the, company, for the commission's consideration here. Um, at a high level, uh, this case involves the proposal to retire four coal-fired electric generating units and three natural gas simple cycle combustion turbine generating units between 2024 and 2027. Um, the units that are being proposed to be retired, um, the coal fire units um, are the E.W. Brown Unit 3, the Ghent Unit 2, and Mill Creek Units 1 and 2. The natural gas fired units that are being proposed to be retired are the Hafling Units 1 and 2 and Patty's Run Unit 12. Now, according to lg &E and KU, all of these seven units are at, are at at or near the end of their useful lives, and the utility said it would require significant investment to continue to operate these units in compliance with changing environmental laws and that the investment would not be cost effective. So that's their petition. In addition, the utility is proposing to replace these, gen this, these four, seven rather, generating units with two natural gas combined cycle facilities, two solar facilities, one battery storage facility, enforce solar power purchase agreements between the time frame of 2026 and 2028. And if this is approved by the commission, the replacement generation would be online between 2026 and 2028, like I said, and it would be at a cost of $2 billion, $95 million. So that's a high level summary of the petition itself. As was mentioned earlier the, by Nancy, there are some interveners that have um, entered as parties to this case, and I'm going to just go over those real quickly with you. Um, the first intervener is the Attorney General, and the Attorney General's Office of Rate, Rate Intervention, that is the agency that represents the consumers before this commission. They are the cu customer advocates, if you will, and they are in this case representing you as such. Another um, intervener is Walmart, then we have the Kentucky Coal Association, the Kentucky Industrial Utility Customers Incorporated, the Sierra Club, Mercer County Physical Courts, we have Metro Louisville and Lexington Fed Urban County Governments, and we also have joint interveners which represent the Metropolitan Housing Coalition, the Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, Kentucky Solar Energy Society, and the Mountain Association. So that is kind of a high level summary of the case. And I'll turn it back over to Linda. Okay, so the next steps. Again, as I mentioned, there are four public meetings across the state. Um, the one Monday night was in Lexington, the one here tonight in Harlan. Then we have one on the 14th of August, and again, the 15th of August, I believe the 14th is Madisonville and the 15th is Louisville. And then on the 16th, we will have a virtual public meeting. Um, if you contact the Public Service Commission, you look on our website, there's information on how to register. Um, if, you, if you had that experience during the pandemic, we do ask people to register for the Zoom calls to make sure people aren't getting on that um, are not that are interested in just disrupting the proceeding and not actually wanting to make public comment. Then the hearing begins in Frankfurt. It's an evidentiary hearing that the witnesses, uh, each party, including the, uh, the applicant and the intervening parties will bring their witnesses and be subject to cross-examination by not only the PSC staff, but all the parties in the case. That will begin on Tuesday, August 22nd at 9 a.m. at the Public Service Commission's office in Frankfurt. Our office is at 211 Sour Boulevard. And as I mentioned earlier, we will accept public comments at the beginning of that hearing on the 22nd in addition to the other public meetings. So you can show up in person, you can register online, um, and if you are interested in watching the hearing as it's going on, it, it, there will be a link on our website so that you can watch it through YouTube. Um, you do have to register to present virtual public comments on the first day of the hearing. So it is open to the public at any time. Um, and then the final order, as Nancy mentioned, is to be entered no later than November 6th of 2023. So, Nancy, go. 
So this is your opportunity to ask questions, but as I want to emphasize, this is about the process of the case. Um, we, we really will not be able to go into any detail about the substance of the case. I can help you with how to find out more information. Um, once we move to the public comment period, and hopefully if you're interested in making public comments that you signed up to uh, register, but we will keep it fairly flexible after we go through everybody that has signed up. If there are people that did not have an opportunity to sign up, um, we, we, we're not that restrictive. We'll, we'll let you come up and you know, make your public comments tonight if you need to. But I want, you, I want everybody to understand that commissioners are not here to answer questions about the case. They're here to take public comments. So that's, that's a little bit of a difference than what, what you may be used to if you've been to other public hearings. So Nancy, if you'll, um, and I want to make sure that I give everyone an opportunity. This is the website, the Public Service Commission's website. Um, this case number is 2022-00402, make sure I didn't stay that wrong. So you can search on our records and the entire public record of this case is available to you. Um, you and again, you can enter public comments and you can send you can send them to our website. You can go on. There's a form you can fill out that it automatically flows in. You can mail us public comments. They all go in the case record. The commissioners, the staff all read through the comments, listen to the comments. If you're interested in mailing them, this is our address is 211 Sour Boulevard. So I want to make sure that everybody understands that um, if you are interested in what KU lg &E has filed in detail, what the intervening parties have filed, um, that's where you find it, is the record of the case. And that's, I know that's a little difficult at times, but um, with that, I will open it up to any questions that you may have. Um, Nancy's gonna help me kind of moderate the questions here um, for the staff, and then we'll turn it over for the public comments. What kind of questions do you have? I have one. Yes, sir. Two point nine million. Is the public due with with where that money coming from? Um, th that would be from the. I mean, all of the costs would be recovered from the ratepayers. Well, the PSC looks at the applications for the rate increase and determines whether it's a fair, just, and reasonable rate. So that. Um, that is not required as part of the case record. I don't know if they have planned something in addition to this or not. So, what other? No. Yes. Yes. Okay, what other question? Um, they have filed an alternatives analysis as part of the case. So if you're interested in looking at that, what the, what would be included in the alternatives analysis, that I'm sure that is part of what the interveners have been looking at as well. Yes, sir. It is, it's very specific wording. Let me, I can, let me, let me double check this and make sure I get the specific wording for you. So what it says is the decision to retire a fossil fuel generating unit is not the result of a federal agency financial incentives or benefits. Is that?
um, that that's I'm um, that's not really part of what we're looking at for this and for this case in terms of the federal incentives and benefits and and the question that you're asking I hear that if it would be really helpful if you would follow public comment so that you can give us more information on that okay I see what you mean I, I, I do not I, I'd have to go back and look at the case record I do not I do not think so. Um, but you may, if that is something you're interested in, that's also something, again, that is part of your public comment. If you ask a question, that it may be something that the commissioners hear and they may be interested in knowing the answer to that question as well. So that, I don't know that you will get an answer back. I mean, you, you won't get an answer back as part of the public comment, but it may be something that um, just that, that w would be appropriate to put in the case record. I was going to say, it, yeah. Yeah, so, can you all hear, can you all hear, I've never had a problem in my entire life of nobody, people not hear me. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, so I, I just want to be clear. So the, the, the two ladies here are wanting to take your, I'm sorry, my name is Kent Chandler, I'm chair of the commission. The, Linda and Nancy would like to answer any questions that you all have on the remainder of the case when the, when is the hearing going to be what are the opportunities to do things like that if you all have comments that you would like to make not questions please hold those for the comment session so that we can get them they can be recorded they can go on the record and they can be part of the record that we make our decision but if you all have specific comments that you want us to consider when we make our decision in this case please hold them for the second part of the second portion of the program tonight right now Linda and Nancy both are very expert in how these cases are processed at the commission, the timing of them, um, the opportunities for interveners, the actual processing of the case. But if it's about the substance of the case, we're not going to sit up here and make either the company's uh, argument for them or the interveners' argument for them. That's not what we're here for. We're coming out to make sure that we hear from you all about your perspective on the case. So if it's, did they ask for this? Did they ask for this other thing? What did somebody say in response to that? We're not going to get in the middle of that. We've got to make a decision based off what people are saying and what people are putting out in front of us. We just want to make sure everybody has a base level understanding of what the case is about and make sure that you all have an appreciation for the timing and the process of the remainder of the case and then give an opportunity for folks here uh, to give us comments for our consideration when we're making our final decision. Oh, I, I understand. I just want to make sure that your comments are on the record so that we can use them for our consideration and they don't get missed out on. Yeah. <laughs> Chairman beat me to it. I was going to say it sounded more like a comment and we wanted to make sure we captured it. Do we have any more questions or are you? Oh, yes, sir. I, let, let me just say when we get to the issue, I hear what you're saying, that the issue of the rate increases is, is quite concerning for you in this. But it sounds to me more like this is more getting into a comment um, because the rate increase isn't in front of us. Right now we're looking at the statutory requirements that we've got to look at for retiring and replacing it. 
but I would really like it if you would share that during the comment piece so that we can record it. Yes? One hundred and eighty days, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, no, I, that, but that, that, is, that is a good procedural question. This case was originally filed strictly as replacement capacity, a, a CPCN case. Once the retirement law went into effect at the end of March, lg and &E, KU had to file a, an application for the retirement. And what we did, without trying to be all lawyerly here, we combined, consolidated the two cases. But the statutory deadline from the SB4, 180 days, applied to that application once it was consolidated. Uh, no, actually, um, I will we'll tell you that as originally filed without the retirements, there was a statutory date that was in there because of one of the uh, things that they're asking for had a statutory date that it just happened to fall on November 6th. Okay. It's the demand side management statute that... I have, to, I have to go look it up for you. Can I, can I get your um, information so that I can give you that information better? Because I don't think I have everything right in front of me to get you a good answer. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, very. It, they can be either. They, they all have different interests. It seems like they have to be in direct And, and this is where we we can't get too deep into into that. But I hear I hear your concern. Yes. That that two billion number was the replacement cost. I don't have it off the top of my head, and that is, that is part of the case that we're looking at, frankly, is what's a reasonable life expectancy. So I, I would be hesitant to go too deep into that. No, no. It would, yes, looking at the costs that come before us um, for every single case, we're evaluating the reasonableness of it. And, you know, part of that reasonableness is going to be what the costs are that are included in, the, in that period. Yes.
Can I? I was going to say, is there a question in that? Because I want to make sure that, okay. That is going to be part of what we're looking at for the reasonableness of it. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that more globally. Any type of law that would apply to this. Because that is one of, one of the pieces of, with the retirement, with the rebuttable presumption, looking at costs to comply with applicable laws, not just environmental. So it is very much a part of what has to be considered. And not just law, but also that would be part of the law, yes. 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 Can I, can I ask you to make sure that, that you add that again during the public comment period so that we capture that in our video? Will you please? Because I think it's important that we hear this. So again, um, the, all of the electric utilities are required to do integrated resource planning as part of the statute. And that's usually when most of the back and forth goes through. The purpose of this proceeding and the Public Service Commission is to rule on the application that has been made and listening to all the evidence and all of the comments. So I guess to the extent there's, there's not gonna be an opportunity for back and forth with the commission staff. Um, but there may be an opportunity as part of the integrated resource planning process with Kentucky Utilities, if that helps answer your question. Okay. What other questions? Can you force that to happen? It is part of the statute, and they are required as part of the statute to include uh, integrated resource planning. So, so what you're saying, be an for them to be here? as part of that process. Now, it, w it won't be part of this case. It'll be part of that when they're putting their planning together, that having groups come together as part of the, that's the whole purpose of that statute. Um, again, it'll be on our website. I mean, they do have to tell us when they're in the process of it, and they do uh, do quite a bit of customer outreach as part of that. And I don't know the statute off the top of my head. This is from the louder gentleman in the back. Uh, it, I, I'm gonna guess it will not be in 2023 um, because the integrated resource plan is triennial. They filed their last one. I just know they filed it in 2021 because that was the case number. So my guess is that they would be creating their 2024, fall 2024 one in early 2024. So it's an entire, what she's commenting on is an entirely separate process from what's, what's in front of us, just to be very clear about the question. Yes, ma'am.
Okay, so let me just stay right here again. This is something that if you would like to offer as part of the public comment, um, that that would be appropriate. Okay. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, I don't know the details on that. Um, I, I don't know the details on the capacity of the compared to. That's getting to be one of the substantive issues of this case because you know, part of this is, is approval of things like purchase power agreements and, and things. So the amount of replacement is indeed part of this case. I, I'd love to be able to give you a here's a hard number, but it's part of what we have to consider in this case. Will that be looked at? I mean, yes, 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 for sure. And if, you would, if you would like to know the answer to the question and are interested in looking at the case record, it would. Um, you can go through the case record and see the testimony filed by the company and the testimony filed by the interveners. And so, okay. okay, what else? Yes, sir. Oh. Okay, let me get here. Okay. I am going to go lawyerly on you. I was going to tell him. The application was submitted, and I had to double check the date in December. An application is not filed until it meets all of the filing requirements. It did not meet all of the filing requirements until early January. And that's also what triggered the November 6 date. So it was Jan January 6 is when it was filed. But it was submitted before that date. We don't, we're, we're, not, we're not doing crowd questions. If you, all, if you all have process questions, the ladies are here to answer. Okay, please proceed. I mean, that, that, that's certainly, and I don't know what, I mean, if you're talking about this hearing tonight, so we issued a press release, we were trying to communicate that. We certainly, we put things on our website. We are open if you um, want to tell us afterwards uh, better ways that you think we can communicate getting the record out. Now, you know, we obviously are not communicating on anything other than the application that's in front of us that was filed in December, as she talked about, and then in January. So, um and we do try and, you know, make sure that our website is up to date when things have been filed. So, okay, the gentleman in the back had a question. So there are a number of interveners in the case. I think we, we had the interveners in the case, and there are, um, th there are a number of them. The Attorney General is part of the advocate for the consumer and that you know we are looking at uh, adequate service safe reliable adequate service um, i know some of the interveners are also looking at reliability and uh, but you would have to look specifically at their testimony to determine which interveners and what their comments are about it um we have a, a no i don't think we we don't have a consumer. hold on okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So I, 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 I try not to talk on these, but uh, so I, I appreciate the question, right? We're, we're, we're really here to get your comments. I am happy to come back. I'll, I'll ask Judge Mosley to borrow his, his hearing room again. I'm happy to, for us to either send somebody or come back down myself and talk specifically about grid reliability and, and concerns about EMPs and all these different things, right? We, we really wanted to get down here because this is the biggest chunk of KU territory that never gets a public meeting on any of the KU 
uh, hearings. Um, you, you've, got, you've got an area of the state that has the former Pineapple Gender Rating Station just right up the road. ODP is just across the border, right? Uh, this is the biggest chunk of KU territory. Every KU case, that's a major, um, every case is major, but every major case, right? Major rate cases, major environmental compliance cases. The Public Service Commission for the last 20 years has gone to Louisville, Lexington, and about one out of every three times in Madisonville. So we came down here for the sole purpose this time, very specifically for this hearing that's going to start on August 22nd that we have to get an order out on November 6th. I know it sounds like a long time. I promise God we have about 500 cases at any given time. So a couple of months is not as much time as you would think. We're down here specifically to talk about this case. I do not want to get to the point where we're asking substantive questions that are, I, I get related. I'm not saying it's not related, but peripheral to the decision that's specifically in front of us. But to very directly answer your question, there is an entity called the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. It is designated by Congress, well, it's basically designated by Congress to be in charge of grid reliability for all of North America. Uh, Canada signed on to it too. So big picture, to answer your question, they're called NERC, North American Electric Reliability Corporation. If you'd like to provide your information afterwards, I'm happy to shoot you an email to give you more information about big picture bulk grid reliability. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we get to the point, I'm going to be very frank with this group. Um, we used to have much more in-depth presentations when we would go do these public comment sessions. And the reason we don't is because every time we would start talking about the application and the interveners and what everybody said in the case, people would start hollering at the person giving the presentation saying, you sound like you work for the company. Well, so it's, it, we're, we're damned if we do and damned if we do, don't in regards to giving too much information about what the case actually looks like. So we sit in these cases kind of like judges, and so we're just not in a position where we can have back and forth where ultimately we're going to have to make a decision. Worst, uh, I, I, the best way I can say it is the, the, we take the back here and the fourth, we're not able to give you a fourth until we enter our order, because that's the only way we can really talk about these cases is through the black and white text on our order. So I'm sorry to give the longer question, but the answer is NERC. <laughs> I understand. No, no, I, I completely understand why you're asking. I'd ask the same question if I was you. I also understand why everybody's asking all the other questions. I just want to make sure it's clear, because I, I think that there's a lot of hesitancy in the answers that you're getting, and I don't want it to be uh, taken as if we're trying to hide something or not trying to be entirely forthright. The reality is we don't want to dig into the substance of the case because the appearance always ends up being that we're making the argument for the parties in the case. It, it really is a catch-22 that we just can't put ourselves in a position. So with that, and, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, unless there is anything else about the process, I, I think the crowd is fairly eager. Yes, sir. Again, I think that's going to be part of the substance of the case. Um, to, yes, I mean, that's really what we're looking at is part of getting, we're the kind of the fact finder and weighing all of the evidence. And we're looking at all, the, all of the parties in the case and what's been put in the case. So I get the sense that this room is ready for some public comments. So, um, yes, sir, yeah. I can answer that one. It's straight out from the statute. The commission either approves the retirement, approves with conditions, or denies it. So with, with that, I'm going to open it up for a public comment. And yeah. so I'm going to turn it over to the chair here. So um, can you all hear me still OK? All right, thank you very much, Linda. So, I, and I just want to piggyback off the first thing that Linda said. She definitely misspoke. She used the word behest when she talked about our, our job. I just want to be clear about the Public Service Commission. The three of us, uh, all commissioners of the Public Service Commission, uh, it's a three-member agency. We are appointed by a governor for four-year terms. Um, we do not, we, we, all of our appointments are subject to review and confirmation by the state senate. All the three of us have been appointed by the current governor and all recently confirmed to our positions by the state senate. 
Um, we are an independent agency. We don't, um, I like to say we, we don't answer to anybody other than consumers. Um, we are administratively attached to the executive branch for things like human resources and budgeting purposes. Uh, but all, all our job is is to carry out the statutes put in effect by the General Assembly. Um, if anybody has questions about us, uh, again, we can't do it back and forth, but our biographies are all on the Public Service Commission website. Do you mind to go to the last page? PSC.ky.gov. I'm going to be very forthright with you, as if I haven't already been tonight. Um, this, we have a terrible website. It is not easy to get around. If you, if you, if I guarantee you, whatever question you have, the information is probably somewhere on our website. So, if if you will send us an email. All of our email addresses are on our website. Phone number, if you have a question and you can't find it on our website, call us. Our 1-800 number is on the front of the website. We, we have somebody on the phone from 8 p.m. Eastern to 5 p.m. Central. Uh, 8 a.m. Eastern to 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so if you can't find something, we can point you in the direction. We can give you the case number. We can find you the answer. Uh, but um, I just want to be very clear that if you go to our website, it's, it's not a panacea, I promise. It's not easy to find your answer, but I know it's there. Um, I also want to reiterate something, and I'll say it at the very end. We can't answer questions. We are here to hear from you so that your comments are on the record so that we can take them into account when making our decision. Okay? This is not your only opportunity for comment. If anybody is a glutton for punishment, Madisonville, we're meeting there in two weeks. You can drive, I think it's, it's at least a six and a half hour drive, seven hour drive. Don't drive all the way to Madisonville for this purpose. We'll also have another meeting in Louisville in two weeks. But I, what I want to say is if there's something that's said tonight after you give a comment or you don't want to give a comment tonight or you find something out next week, we have two more opportunities for public comment that are convenient. One is a virtual opportunity on the 15th of August. All you have to do is go on our website. And, I know what I just said about it, but all you have to do is go on our website and send in your interest, and we will sign you up to provide virtual public comments. You can call in, you can get on the computer, either one, and it'll be August the 15th at 4.30, 4.30 Eastern. The other opportunity, you can do this virtually or in person, is we're going to have another public comment session we always do right as soon as the hearing starts, in this case, on August the 22nd at 9 a.m. in Frankfurt at our headquarters. You can come in person and provide public comments, or again, we will have instructions on our website where you can send in your interest and you can call in or do it by computer promptly at 9 a.m. Uh, if, if we have a half a day of public comments on the case, so be it. That's what we're here for. Um, so, sorry, I just want to make sure I, I get all that there. With that being said, I'll uh, reintroduce myself. I'm Kent Chandler. I'm chairman of the Public Service Commission. Uh, I'm joined tonight by the rest of our commission. Uh, to my right is Vice Chair Angie Hatton. To my left is Commissioner Mary Pat Regan. Just want to make sure everybody's aware that this, here, this meeting, public comment session, is being recorded for the benefit of the record uh, and so that we can uh, consider it at a later time. Uh, since it is being recorded, it will be uploaded to our YouTube site. Uh, and be included in the case record. Uh, we're here to take comments on the application by Louisville Gas and Electric and Kentucky Utilities, specifically in case number 2022-00402. Again, that's Kentucky Utilities and Louisville Gas and Electric. To reiterate a point that was made during the overview, or the overview of the application, the role and obligation of the PSC is to ensure that the application does or does not meet the statutory standard in this case, including whether there is a need for the proposed generation and whether the proposed generation results in wasteful duplication. We understand that in any proceeding there are strong opinions. We ask that you provide your comments today, that you are respectful and mindful of each other and of the time limit limited for each speaker. We are here to listen. The utility is not presenting today. None of the interveners are presenting today. The utility and all of the other parties will have an opportunity to make their case to us during the pendency of this matter. This is an opportunity to provide customers of the utility and the public to state their positions, concerns, and to provide the commission comments for our consideration. Again, we're here to listen. During today's comment session, we will not be answering questions. The commission is the fact finder and the decision maker in the case, and as such, we are unable to comment or speak to the process or substance of the pending application. Nevertheless, if you have questions, ask them. Ask them assuming 
that your comments and questions may be of assistance to us. We may have the same questions and ask them of the utility, or the utility may hear them tonight and have an answer for you. If you have a question for the utility or the parties to the case, please think about asking those tonight so that those parties may be able to get with you directly. If you have, if you would like to contact the utility, information on contacting the utility, um, information and phone numbers for contacting the utility can be found by contacting the Public Service Commission. We have an email address that we can give you tonight and we have phone numbers for the PSC that we can give you tonight. Uh, at this time, I would like to ask if there's anybody from the applicants here, Louisville Gas and Electric, Kentucky Utilities. Thank you. I see you, Rick. Is there anybody here from the Office of the Attorney General? Okay. Uh, given the number of participants that have initially indicated their interest in providing comments, we will be limiting the length of comments to seven minutes apiece. We will let you know when you have one minute remaining. When there is one minute remaining in your comment time, I will raise my piece of paper here just to give you the indication. I'm not going to cut you off or say anything until you actually hit the seven minutes. Um, as always, written comments can be provided to the Commission at any time before we enter an order on a case. We ask that if you provide written comments to the Commission, that they include your name, your address, and the case number. Uh, do you mind, does the first slide have the case number? Any comment that you send to us needs to have the case number so it gets to the right place so that we can consider it. The case number in this case is 2022 dash zero zero four zero two. Okay. You can mail comments to the Public Service Commission. Do you mind to go to the last slide again? I'm sorry. You can mail comments to the Public Service Commission at 211 Sour Boulevard, S-O-W-E-R, Frankfort, Kentucky, 40601 or 40602, or you can mail them. We have a, a very specific email address that you can send your public comments to, psc.comment at ky.gov. Again, name, address, case number. Tonight, when you come up to the microphone, I'll announce everybody that signed up for public comments. I'd ask that when you speak, you provide your name and your address. Uh, I won't start the timer until you actually start providing your comments. I'm not going to let you take up, I'm not going to let you use up seconds for your name and address. Um, and anybody who has written comments that they're going to be reading from tonight, if you hit your seven minute max, um, please give us those written comments afterwards and we will put those manually and scan them in tomorrow and put them into the case record. So uh, I'm going by the order in which folks signed up, um, and the first person that indicated that they were interested in provided public comments is a Donald Farmer. And as Mr. Farmer's approaching, I just want to let folks know, because um, I got yelled at about this about three years ago, uh, if I'm looking down or if any of us are looking down, it's at our iPads, uh, and we're taking notes on what you're saying. I promise we're not doing some, playing a game or doing something else. We're taking notes on what you're saying. So don't, don't take it as a sign of disrespect. So, Mr. Farmer, would you like to go ahead and start? I'm Donald Farmer. I live in Cumberland, Kentucky, uh, and coal mining has been my career for 50 years. Uh, the last company I worked for, they had to shut down in 2020. And through retirement, I was actually called back out to work for a new company, which I'm very glad that that happened. My comment is, since 2013, I think the utility company has closed down 11 coal-fired plants, with another four proposed to close down by 2028. My question is, of those 15, I'm thinking at least half of them could have been rehabbed to use coal again. And that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. Uh, the next person that signed up is uh, Justice. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes. So members of the commission, thank you for your time. These issues are very concerning for all of Eastern Kentucky. And if we're wondering what the potential outcome of such a decision like this could be, you have to look no further in Pike County and the residential customers of Kentucky Power, who in approximately the last decade have seen nearly an 80% increase in their power bills and actually have the highest power bills in the entire state. During that same time frame, LG&E customers had a 33% increase in their power bills 
and, and there's other examples as well. So what do they have in common? It's the closing of these coal fire plants. So that's what these decisions can do. I have a constituent who lives in a double wide and pays 500 to $600 a month. And I have another friend who lives in Winchester who's basically in a mansion who pays 150 to $200 a month. So that's the kind of impact that decisions like this can make. All across these counties, we have people who are having to choose between groceries or their electricity, or they're having to choose between gasoline and their electricity bill. So that's the kind of impact that these decisions make. I would like to read you a letter that I'll be submitting on behalf of myself, Representative Jacob Justice, Representative Ashley, Ashley Tackett Lafferty, Senator Philip Willer, and Senator Johnny Turner. Dear members of the Kentucky Public Service Commission, we write to you today to oppose Louisville Gas and Electric Company and Kentucky Utilities request that Kentucky's Public Service Commission to approve spending and cost recovery measures through utility rates of over $2 billion. This attempt by LG&E and KU to transition away from coal will cost the customers thousands of dollars and send us down a path towards increasingly unreliable energy production. Rejecting this proposal would save our state taxpayers millions, it would protect our jobs, and it would ensure that our power grid is not put at risk over false promises of green energy. While LG&E and KU claim these actions are necessary to comply with federal air emissions requirements, which are expected to be implemented this year, we know that it's simply not true. The cost to install environmental controls required to comply with the rule would only be $264 million, a fraction of the requested over $2 billion. This claim is just a smokescreen to implement their radical and damaging agenda. Worse, however, would be the immediate and unmanageable increase in costs that the customers would face. In every instance that we've seen reliable coal fire plants shut down, we've witnessed some of the highest rate increases in history. Customers impacted uh, face rate increases of nearly 80% in some instances. Following the closure of Kentucky Power's Big Sandy coal fire plant in Lawrence County, customers were burdened with the highest electrical rates in Kentucky. At a time of already record high inflation and record high energy cost, it would be a derelict of duty to force even higher prices on these American families. Allowing utilities to close down coal-fired plants faster than the often, often promised replacements, such as wind and solar, bef before they can be brought online would, be, would lead to devastating outcomes. In their recently, in their recently released 2022 long-term reliability assessment, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, NERC, as they mentioned earlier, warned that continued retirement of coal and natural gas baseload generation endangers the reliability of the grid. So simply put, the American energy grid should not be a guinea pig for the green energy activists. So we urge the members of the commission whose primary charge is the protection of customers from such dangers to take steps needed to preserve the reliability and affordability of our state's electric grid by halting the closure of our remaining baseload electric generation plants. Our nation is simply not prepared to abandon our most reliable energy. We hope you will agree and stand up for the thousands of Kentuckians who may be negatively impacted. Thank you. Will you make sure if you want to include that at the record that you make sure you provide us a written copy of that? All right, thank you. Signed up is uh, Judge Mosley. Mr. Chairman, before I make my remarks, I would like to address the crowd for a moment about the facilities. Oh, sure. And I do want people to come in if there's anybody in the hallway as well. If you are outside, there's still room to stand on this side over here. If those of you that are new to the building, the restrooms are over on this side. If you need a cup of water, I realize it's a bit toasty in here, or a cup of coffee, my office is open. Feel free to go in. If you want a soft drink, there's some back there too, so help yourself. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, thank you for coming to Harlan County this evening to hear our comments and concerns 
about case number 2022-00402 in which Louisville Gas and Electric and Kentucky Utilities LG and EKU companies request to retire four coal-fired electric generating units and three natural gas simple cycle units. I'm Dan Mosley, Harlan County Judge Executive, and I live in Baxter, Kentucky. I'm here tonight to speak in opposition of this case and respectfully request that the plan submitted be denied. LG&E KU's proposal includes replacing the current systems with two natural gas combined cycle facilities, two solar facilities, one battery storage facility, and four solar power purchase agreements. It is my understanding that if approved, the replacement generation would be online between 2026 and 2028 and would cost $2.09 billion. I'm personally opposed to this plan for several reasons and I would like to explain my position in the next few minutes. One, I fear this new plan will cost ratepayers more money on monthly electric bills. Coal has consistently been the cheapest form of electricity and Kentucky was known for years for having some of the lowest utility rates in the nation. Retiring coal plants and replacing with other sources will negatively impact rates, in my opinion, just has been the trend since 2013. Since that year, it is a proven fact that 11 coal-fired plants have been shut down in Kentucky and rates have still gone up on ratepayers in Kentucky. Utility companies that argue to close these plants argue that costs will only increase if they don't eliminate these plants. Some of the plant closures that were supposed to save ratepayers money have not since closures occurred from 2013 to 2022. Over that time frame, rates have increased as utilities have decreased the use of coal by closing down plants. Also over that time frame, 2013 to 2022, Kentucky went from the number three state in the nation for the cheapest electricity to number 21. This undoubtedly has caused us to lose industry and added to the complexities of recruiting new industry to our county and region. Number two, I have another serious question as was mentioned previously. Who will pay the $2.09 billion to do this? That answer is all of us in this room, the ratepayers. As you are aware, our region of this state has been poverty stricken for many years. Our people, especially those on a fixed income, cannot afford this burden to be added to their utility bills. My question as well related to this issue, is the $2.09 billion cost including the decommissioning or will that be another expense and burden our people would have to pay just like our neighbors in other parts of Eastern Kentucky are having to do regarding the Kentucky Power Big Sandy coal plant shutdown? Does the $2.09 billion account for decommissioning of these plants? Is that going to show up as another fee on ratepayers' bills? Number three, I'm also seriously concerned about the reliability if this plan is approved. We saw rolling blackouts this past winter in Harlan County because the demand for electricity could not be met during sub-zero temperature periods. My concern is that demand will get even higher as we transition to electric vehicles in this nation. And without the reliability that coal generation plants provide, this could cause more unannounced rolling blackouts in the future. Rolling blackouts are dangerous, especially to people who depend on electricity like many people in this county who suffer from COPD and black lung. They need electricity for their health needs so that they can use their oxygen. Number four, we mine coal in Harlan County in eastern and western Kentucky that provide jobs and a way for people to live the American dream. We should utilize more coal, not less, in our energy portfolio in this state for that simple reason. If old coal plants are going to be retired, more new coal-fired plants should be built or old plants should be retrofitted. Germany and other countries converted to other sources of energy and are now going back to coal because the other sources didn't keep up with demand. China is building a record number of coal-fired plants because it's reliable and it's cost-effective. Our state and our nation should learn from what others are doing and not turn away from coal 
that provides energy in a cost-effective way that is mined by Kentuckians that are living and paying taxes in this state. Utilities argue that increases on rates are necessary because of lost customers in our region of eastern and western Kentucky. They're complicit in that loss by turning away from the very resource that has provided jobs for thousands of people and indirect jobs for thousands more. Utility companies have become jaded by an agenda to turn away from coal. They've become bright-eyed at federal incentives to reduce the carbon footprint. The invisible box that utilities have been put in is what I would commonly refer to as extortion. In this case, we must push back against this notion. We must stand with Kentucky and for Kentucky's people, the ratepayers. Once again, I thank you for your service to this commission. Thank you for coming to Harlan County this evening, and I humbly ask this plan be rejected once the hearing process concludes. Thank you, and may God bless each of you. Written version of that to the record, please make sure we have it tonight before we leave. Um, the next person is Leo Miller. Commission members, uh, Leo Miller, live in Harlan, Kentucky. Um, chairman, Vice Chairman, Commissioner, thank you for coming to Harlan County. Uh, I know that uh, usually in Louisville, Lexington, Madisonville, but I can't say it better than Judge Mosley said. You know, coal keeps food on the table, table for people. Uh, it's provided for me my whole life. So uh, I will be short. Coal is tried and true. We need to do more with coal, preserve our energy here keep our utility rates low. Our folks cannot afford higher rates. I appreciate you guys and hope you do not deny the proposal. Thank you. Ball. Good evening, Commission members. I'm Jack Ball from Wallens, Kentucky, and I would ask that you oppose this project and that you oppose any further rates that this is going to increase on us. Thank you. Thank you. reiterate um, what Judge Moses said. If there's anybody out there in the hallway that would like to come in, there's plenty of room. Is there anybody out there that I can't actually see past the, the person in the door, so I don't know if there's 100 people or one. So. All right. Um, the next person that indicated their interest in speaking is oh, Senator Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, PSC is a great institution. I'm proud to say on behalf of these Kentuckians sitting, sitting and standing here behind me that uh, the legislative body has given you all a good directive. We passed some, as you commented, some recent statutory requirements, uh, putting the burden on these institutions to prove the necessity. We've had many testimony, uh, that much testimony in the last two years, basically, uh, and that helped us in passing this legislation uh, to enforce it uh, by these institutions that are wanting to tear down these things, including the TVA, but getting ready to tear some down in, out in the western part of the state, admitting and acknowledging that the now new government in Washington is providing them with incentives to bring these things into on, put on these people. I, I don't need to say nothing about coal. Everybody knows it's, it's the thing that saved America from way back World War I, World War II, all the way up through. And the people here are now getting punished by it and not getting considered we had the good rates as somebody's already said. Uh, we, we should as a group, and I appreciate and hope everybody in here gets some comment, uh, they want to replace one of these with gas. We had uh, 
one of the utilities out in Western Kentucky come tell us about they got all this Texas gas that's in the land out there in this freezing. County Judge talked about this cold. The ground froze a little bit, wouldn't 20 below zero. Hope and pray that never happens. They never get no gas out there for what happened then. A valve froze. It took them almost two days to find out where it was at and what it was. They kept bragging about how much of that Texas gas. They didn't say what safety things they've got if we have an earthquake between here and Texas and all those thousand peoples. They didn't even have a notification to the people about that problem. And I just, while we were sitting there, got a little thing on my phone from Memphis about some child had been kidnapped. And I told him, I said, so you can't do that to protect all those citizens that may need emergency electricity right there? So it's coming out. Solar, we had a big meeting today. But this group that talks about the energy, especially in the, the eastern United States. And we all know that solar only works what? When there's sun. Some of it only works when there's wind. Battery storage works when you can get some battery in. That's not, that's not been tested to the extent it has. So we have placed good statutory provision in here that I'm sure that you all will listen to all these people and take that all into consideration and make sure that these institutions that are charging these people so much in electricity bills will be held accountable and not let this happen because they haven't got enough replacement from the facts that stand now to show that it'll even work. And the billion dollar numbers, astronomical, the tires they're tearing down may have 20 more years of life, and the rate payers are going to have to pay the, those bills already. It's like buying a car. You pay it off in four years, but you're going to have to keep paying here, just like you just kept paying the same payments for driving it. And these rates will increase, so we hope that the accountability will defeat them from getting this thing passed. Thank you all for your consideration. Carl Sharp, Carl Shoop. Okay. Dustin Shackelford. Bobby Greer or Bobby Green. Joe Bennett. I'd like to thank the commission for being here tonight. My name's Joe Bennett. I'm living at Gray's Knob, Kentucky. Been in the mining business for many years. I'd like the commission to take into consideration the available storage of the fuel that these plants will require and compare that to coal. What can be placed on the ground that's available for use no matter what in the generation of power for the people of Kentucky? That's a, the concern of the reliability of the grid is my greatest concern and the cost of the jobs that are possibly lost with this transition. I appreciate your all's time. Rayburn Doss. Melton Middleton. I'd like to thank you all for coming today and talking to us. Uh, my name is Melton Middleton and I'm from Everett, Kentucky. I would just like to point out, uh, I don't have to brag on how good coal is. Everyone else here has done pointed that out. Coal is the cheapest, most efficient form of electricity generation in the world, period. Uh, I'm not 
opposed to solar or wind or any alternatives, but they have to prove their worth just like coal did. Uh, I would just like to point out the hypocrisy that KU and LG&E are espousing with this. Uh, they claim that they want to do this for greener energy to meet EPA regulations, it's more efficient, it's the future, but they don't point out all of the carbon emission they're going to create with manufacturing of solar panels, batteries, the mining of these batteries, the production of wind turbines, how recyclable are wind turbines, solar panels, and the batteries. You don't have to recycle coal, coal burns away and you dig for more. I'd also like to point out if KU and LG&E really cared about the environment and creating efficient power for their customers, the ratepayers, then they would have had invested in possibly nuclear, the only other power to show that it can compete with coal and be net zero in carbon emission. Just like anything else though, it's got to prove its worth. Coal has already proved its worth. It is the cheapest, the most efficient form of electricity on the planet. I would just like to point out that Mercer County is getting ready to lose 900 acres of beautiful farmland for a solar farm. I don't know if anyone here has ever seen a solar farm, but it's a field of glass panels with mud and gunk all up under it. One of my favorite things of Kentucky is how beautiful it is. And I would like for my children and my grandchildren and all future generations to appreciate the beauty of Kentucky and not a bunch of fields of glass panels sitting everywhere. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. Tom Shepard. Thank you. Uh, I always say it's a thankless job, so I take them. I take them when I can get them. Uh, John Combs. Unless you're on a plane, don't apologize for clapping. Uh, my name's John Combs. I'm from Pineville, Kentucky. I want to talk to you about a couple issues off the record at the same time. I'd rather not be filmed. I don't care to be filmed for this hearing, but I'm not looking to be on television. That's not what I'm about. Uh, what I'm about is the folks I know in this room and in the rooms all throughout Appalachia and I think I can speak of West Virginia and Virginia, uh, Tennessee, and certainly East Kentucky. I can speak of Alabama. But that Appalachian culture is what is being attacked here. Number one, I do appreciate you all coming down. It gives us somewhat of a voice that sometimes most of us feel like we don't have. But that's probably not just here. That's throughout the U.S. I don't think it's just designed to Harlan, Bell County. But I wrote some notes down, and, I, and I'm not going to read this. I'll pass it out. You can get it on the Internet. But your job is finished, in my humble opinion, if this is a government agency. And let me say this about Kentucky Utilities. I think that's one of the best companies that I ever had the chance to grow up with. There was KU every time there was an emergency. You knew the linemen. You knew the folks behind the counter. You knew this. And things change. I think 70% of the people that I know throughout the state of Kentucky, the folks I talk to about this, are not for this project, shutting down coal fire power plants. That's my uneducated guess, is if you talk to 70% of the employees of that company, that you would find out they're against this. Several people are against this, and this is why I'm saying that your job is finished, in my opinion. Because I think you've got an application in front of you. Number one, power providers beg Biden for fossil fuels 
say renewable energy alone can't keep the grid reliable. And now this is current. This is just what these gentlemen have said. So things change. That might not have been the case five years ago. We didn't know about the brownouts. We didn't know when Don was mining coal that 89% of Kentucky's electricity was generated by coal. 85, 89%. I don't know what the percentage is now, but I know we, we supplied 58, 59% of the U.S. energy 20 years ago, coal did. Then it went down to 40, went down to 30. We're hanging on at 20% right now. And I do not claim to be a worldly business person. I'm not. But at 65 years old, the guys behind me, yeah, they're customers. But being on the phone with Australia and India, China, just finished doing some business in Mexico. We're a small company down here. I'm doing that to provide the jobs. We got 44 employees. There's not enough industry going on right now for us to supply that unless we reach out to that kind of global demand. So commission, just go ahead and follow the global path on what has been submitted in front of you. Because the global, the global path is telling you that India, China, Taiwan, Japan are, doing a, are, are going back to coal. It's right here. This is current information. So if this gentleman here gave me an application a year ago, and I thanked him for it, but I'm looking at it in the summer of 2023, I got to look at him and say, I'm not going to approve your application based on this. And this is facts. Now you can find anything on the internet that some people want us to believe that coal is not reliable. You can find the, the internet numbers that show that we've gone from this 55% down to 20. I'm a proud uncle of a brand new baby today. Proud uncle. I promise you, my sister and brother, my sister, my sister and brother in law, don't admit I called him a brother. <laughs> but I promise you, they're not there talking to the doctors tonight. And I don't think anybody here would be to say, what sex are we going to, are we going to call this child? Modern science says there are six sexes. I just read it. I didn't make that up. So they can sit down with my newborn nephew, who is a man, who's a boy. They, this stuff should not have the right to determine how we live. And I'm just bringing this into this when you hear about the climate change. I've got as much information here that caused climate change debunked from scientists. But you don't hear about that here in Appalachia. Appalachia is a very small voice in the big scheme of things. I was telling Joe Lawson, it tickled me to death for Joe to say, I want to come up here tonight. That shows me we're passing the torch to that generation who can see that Appalachia is not just an attack on Harlem not just an attack or it's not just Kentucky utilities whoever's talking about Kentucky power I lived and watched that too it's horrible commission we don't have to let horrible come to Appalachia we don't have to do that they can make applications all day but I go back to the six sexes that somebody's trying to ram down our throat and this is today <laughs> That's not, that's not science's choice. And I just think we're getting debunked with some of this other alternative theory. And I'm for everything. But I'll be damned if they have not put their foot on the neck of the coal mine. And I'm sick of it. Thank you for your time. John. John.
I have to recall to John. John, if you want to put that in the record, uh, just make sure that we have it afterwards. <laughs> All right, that'd be great. Paul Browning. Paul Browning, um, District 3 Magistrate here in Harlan County, also a resident of Cumberland, Kentucky. First and foremost, thank you for coming here. This is um, kind of monumental in the, in the world of public service commissions, and I'm grateful we don't have to go to Frankfurt to, to let our voices be heard, so thank you very much for that. I don't know if I can add much to what has been said here tonight, and if you could, uh, if you could read mines, well, we'd probably have to put a few blackout marks and some other things uh, that are going along with this uh, this application but it really kind of does boil down to our way of life here and going forward coal is certainly the most reliable energy source I, I don't there, there's no denying that I don't care what scientific report you pull up that's the fact sometimes the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow this almost sounds like a bad country song but, uh, <laughs> but it could be a really bad country song if we turn to all wind and solar and the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Um, these are not reliable. They're, it's just, these are facts. They're, they're not as reliable as coal is. We have coal. There are plants there. Uh, if they wanted to add alternative forms of energy along with keeping these plants online, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Maybe they could take the alternative energy that's generated through these forms that are non-coal, sell that on the grid to other states. We'll stick with coal and got plenty of electricity. We'll be fine with that. And they won't have to pass that rate on to us. We're not rich people. But we're hardworking, honest people. And this is how we make our living. And I would agree that with Mr. Combs that it does feel like the boot is on our neck at times. And that's not okay. It's just not okay. We try to do economic development here. We went from the third least expensive state for energy consumption or purchase to 21 now, is that 21st? That's not helping. Logistically, uh, I guess as old brother where art thou says, we're, we're, we're a geographic anomaly. We're two weeks away from everything. So we've already got our backs against the wall when it comes to economic development and finding other ways for folks here to live the American dream or to just feed their children, grandchildren, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers. I would just really appreciate if you would take into consideration when you're looking over this application that there's more to this than just retiring a plant or building a plant you could retire my car and give me a different car that's that's okay if you retire my Chevrolet though and give me a car I've never heard of I might not make it back home and it's gonna cost more so we're making 50 and 100 year decisions based on current EPA regulations this will affect the current generation and generations to come if this application is approved. And who knows, maybe next year we have a different president, a different head of the EPA, and they said, ah, we're going a different direction. We think coal's awesome. Then where are we at? We've got a bill for $2 billion, with a B, $95 million that we're still going to be paying for, whether the EPA changes their mind or not. So I ask this commission to please reject the proposal that's in front of you and to please just look a little deeper than what's on the piece of paper. Thank you, guys. Tim Rice. My name's Tim Rice. I'm from Harlan, Kentucky. And I, too, would like to very much thank you guys for coming down and spending the evening with us. 
I know you have a long drive home. Um, when I was in second grade, I remember we used to get a weekly reader. And there's so many things I, I go back and I remember from my weekly reader. And this was a long time ago. And I remember reading that we were going into a, a global ice age. Now, this was science telling us this. We were going into a global ice age. Okay. More recently, science has told us that COVID came from bats in the wild. Then they say we've come out with vaccines that will keep you from getting COVID. No way you're going to get COVID. Well, maybe then we change it a little bit. Well, maybe you might get it, but you won't get very sick. Well, you might get sick. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is we look at science. Um, is this great know-all that we, we just know is factual? Now, to John's point, they're telling us there's six different sexes. I mean, this is it's insane. Um, but, but like so many of us have said, we here in eastern Kentucky mine the coal that creates our power. And we pay the bills, which are not as great because of that. And so now they're wanting to not only take our jobs away from us, they're going to raise our rates. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how we can, we can make it much longer with this kind of attack. And I hope you guys will consider this. And I hope you guys will understand that um, this kind of reaction is not going to bode well for the people that you're serving. Because I know y'all serve the customers, not the power. I know that. And I appreciate that. And please consider us when you're making your decisions. Thank you very much. Greg Farley. Uh, my name is Greg Farley, uh, resident of Wallens Creek, Kentucky. Uh, I'll apologize to you. I didn't dress prepared to stand in front of anybody tonight. Um, but uh, to the commissioners, thank you for coming down here. Um, you've got a tough job. Um, we appreciate you being here. Uh, I simply ask that you don't just hear us, but listen to us. Uh, I wish it had better weather for the drive down. Unfortunately, it was so rainy, none of us saw the sunshine today. And uh, it'll be dark as you drive home, probably. So I'm glad the state of Kentucky didn't issue a solar paired car to you. Um, I understand that the plan has answers about what would happen on days when the sun don't shine. Um, I spent a good part of this day researching battery systems for power storage. Uh, did that today because I just heard about this meeting yesterday. Uh, it's something I'm interested in, but something I've not studied. But one of the things I read today was that uh, the uh, battery electric storage systems, BESS systems, like is dis discussed in this plan, uh, with current technology has a um, useful life of about 8 to 15 years. Um, now, this, this whole plan is looking decades beyond that, but in about 8 to 15 years, I expect that before some of us gets our, where'd that fella go? Yeah, before his uh, little boy gets out of high school, we'll be back here talking about rate increases um, for the replacement battery systems that we're gonna need. Um, so that's, that's something to take into consideration. Um, I also read about an option of, uh, you know, when we need uh, supplemental power that uh, we can buy from, um, a regional transmission organization uh, for our region that would be a, a, a place called P, or a group called PJM that I just read about today for the first time I also read that between 2019 and 2022 uh, PJM rates increased by 100 percent they doubled in three years probably because a lot of power generation facilities throughout that whole system is already making the transition to green power. It's, we're just not there yet. Um, 
I'll go on to say that uh, coal-fired plants could surely be refurbished at a cost to the utilities customers of less than $2.9 billion. I was thinking about the comparison to an automobile. If a crook gets up under your car and saws out the catalytic converter, you don't scrap the car. You get a new catal catalytic converter. Yes, it's expensive, but that's what happens in, in a uh, coal-fired plant. You, the system scrubs out the pollutants and then, um, you know, what's emitted is nearly as clean as can be. So, uh, like, uh, like the gentleman from Pike County said, seems much more economical to uh, the utility customers to retrofit, refit, refurbish those old um, coal-fired plants. Um, and I'm going to touch on what I said a little earlier, too, uh, in the uh, question phase. Uh, this project proposes to construct solar arrays likely using solar panels produced in China. Why? Because China ripped off our technology, which we were at the forefront of solar technology beginning in the 50s up through 1978. Uh, 1978, I read today, 80% of solar panels worldwide were manufactured in the United States. Now they're making them in China. That's because they can do it much more cheaply, much more efficiently in Chinese factories because they're bringing an average of two coal-fired power plants a week online. They've got cheap energy. They can make stuff cheaper. So I uh, wanted to touch on that. But <clears throat> when they make these, they're going to put them onto a truck or a train, move them to the coast, put them on a ship, bring them here, put them on another ship, or put them on another truck or train, and move them on to Kentucky. And all that's going to be done by diesel fuel or gasoline. So take that into consideration. Um, I, I'll, I'll close up by saying that I know that your job isn't political. Uh, you're here to hear from the utilities customers. Um, but I think to LG&E and to Kentucky Utilities, um, this whole program is political. It's about a company's ESG score as they look for investors and as they look to be appealing to, to uh, or for investment. Uh, it's also political because the sitting president made it his business on day one of his administration to choose winners and losers in the energy sector. Um, one day in the future, maybe solar and wind and other carbon neutral sources may supply all of our needs, but it's being forced for political reasons, and we'll end up victims of this experiment. Thank you all. Take a guess here. Wayne Hopkins. Elizabeth Pulley. Okay, can you hear me? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Elizabeth Pulley. I live on the Bell Harlan line. Um, I oppose this pr proposal and I believe it should be denied. I hope I speak for my generation as we fear the future and wish someone would listen. Students are leaving for college and aren't coming back. Let's look around this room for a moment because, um, you know, there's not many of us. They want a safer, cleaner, and forward future thinking. We can deny climate change. I encourage everyone to find reliable resources when researching, but the flooding in July prove that these companies exploiting our land and our workers and refusing to clean up after themselves resulted in one of the most devastating events of our era. 
the continued exploitation of Kentuckians and our homes will leave this state desolate. I do not want or support an expensive pollution infrastructure. PPL, the parent company of LG&E and KU, own commitment to renewable energy and climate change justice is at question here. Creating more harmful jobs for ourselves and the environment is not progress. How will PPE be net zero by 2050 as committed with a 40 year plan based on exploiting the environment and the community? We need the scale of our solutions to be as big as the problem. Closing coal plants for natural gas plants is not a sustainable method. Natural gas creates methane, a greenhouse gas that is 100 times more potent than carbon dioxide produced by coal. Kentucky is in the worst. Kentucky is the worst in the nation for renewable resources. Do not let coal sto sh steal the show here. This proposal is not just devastating for our environment, but also our most underserved areas. Utilities should assume the risk of volatile fuel costs, a 15% monthly increase on top of volatile fuel costs paid for by the taxpayers will deepen the strain low-income families already suffer in Appalachia. They are exploiting us and our struggles so that the shareholders can, can continue to profit as they have every year. Kentucky has one of the poorest records in the country for energy efficiency in terms of residential efficiency programs and savings. This proposal seeks to protect the company from risk at the expense of taxpayers. There is no incentive for the company to avoid peak fuel rates because they aren't paying for it. They propose to slash locally owned solar by slashing nearly 80% of the value with a proposed cap of 1%. So even if we want to reach out for renewable resources, you can't do that. PPL, PPL, the parent company, increased dividends 13 times in 14 years. They boasted about a 6% shareholder increase for the year of 2015. Why do we continue to let these companies exploit and take from us and leave behind high rates, pollution causing high cancer rates, and the destruction of our atmosphere? Thank you. Allison Hopper. Brian Morgan. Representative Bowling, you're the last one. Good evening. It's good to see everyone. Um, my name is Adam Bowling, state representative for the 87th district, representing Harlan and Bell counties. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to express my appreciation for the opportunity to be here this evening to discuss the matter it is not only important to the people of the 87th House District, but to citizens across the Commonwealth. I believe it goes without saying that coal is a mainstay in Kentucky. It is a staple to, in our state's history, from the economic impacts in coal communities across the eastern part of our Commonwealth, to the energy it supplies all 120 counties and even surrounding states. Chances are everyone in this room knows, is, or is related to someone who has worked or is currently working in a coal mine. The retiring of coal-powered energy producing plants is in its entirely a bad idea, both fiscally and socially. Why would we risk abandoning a tried and true method of production for a less reliable and less cost-efficient method? This is bad policy for our region, our state, and our nation. It's bad for our region as ratepayers will be Less re as it will be less reliable, more costly, and will continue to drive up an exodus of working men and women from Harlan and Bell counties. As more people leave and our population declines, the ratepayers are left to pay more and more as the fixed costs of the grid are divided among fewer and fewer customers. This is bad policy for our state as costs rise and, re and reliability declines. One of Kentucky's top selling points in recruiting companies for economic development are low and reliable electric rates. As rates rise and reliability declines, Kentucky will lose one of our strongest economic advantages. And this is bad policy for our nation. The United States competes with nations in a global economy. Our competitors in China, India, and even Europe are developing new coal-powered plants, giving them, the companies that are located there, and the citizens who live there cost-efficient, reliable electricity. This plan makes us less productive 
and less competitive as a nation on the world stage. On top of that, this plan calls for new solar power. What this plan does not take into account is that the panels and the rare earth elements needed to build those panels are controlled nearly exclusively by a country that is hostile to our nation, China. So our domestic energy production will now rely on Chinese manufacturing. China gains from this plan and our ratepayers will, will lose. This is not only not smart, this causes national security issues for our country. While the effectiveness of newer methods of energy production is debatable, the state of our power grid and the demand for services is not. Here in Kentucky, we know coal. It has powered our homes for generations. It has gotten us through heat waves and cold snaps. As we have seen coal plants go offline, we have begun to see challenges throughout the state. As temperatures hit record lows last December, several customers across our district endured what is known as rolling blackouts at a time where they needed electricity the most. People on oxygen were cut off without warning. Families with young children went through Christmas season in essentially sub-zero temperatures, relying on alternative sources of heat. This all begs the question, why would we do something to, put, to risk putting ourselves in a similar situation? While we might not be able to make the wind blow or the sunshine, we know how to make coal burn. It is important to weigh the potential consequences of these actions holistically. As the, eight old, as the age old adage goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Thank you all for your time and thank you for coming to Harlan County. So that is the end of the list that I have uh, that indicate people are interested in providing public comments. Is there anybody that signed up whose name I didn't call? All right, is there anybody who would like to provide public comments but did not sign up that they would like to provide public comments? Oh, you did sign up. Well, I was actually gonna say, regardless, it's first come, first serve. Uh, so if you'd like to go first, uh, come on up. Um, Oh, as I indicated earlier, um, please provide your name, your address, uh, and then as you provide your comments, you can start. Uh, and then anybody else that would like, uh, just be ready after Mr. Uh, Brian Howard. Brian Howard is done. Please Brian start. Brian Howard, I'm from Harlan County. Uh, I'd like to thank the chair and commission for coming here. This is great. I never really knew this existed before now. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, couple things you know they've, they've really covered a lot of this we know coal's cheaper we know that coal plants were shut down several years ago and all of our rates went up over the course of the years my home uses less electricity because we've you know added the new type of light fixtures the the appliances and things that all save energy so i can show that i'm using less but my bill continues to rise uh, we know that the cost of the two billion we will be passed on to us like it was last time you know, while the executive of PPL Corporation made over $9 million last year, uh, I'm not sure the rest of the executive staff. But <clears throat> so and I will ramble a little bit because I don't have written notes. Two-thirds of the world's population is not worried about green energy. So anything that our state does like that to, 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 to save a little bit, it's really in the grand scheme of things, if, if you're looking at this totally from a green energy, is energy thing, it's not really going to make a difference. China and India are building coal-fired plants like crazy. Uh, it's the cheapest, most cost-effective. It's where the world's most pollution comes from. Now, as far as if this, which I feel like from um, PPL Corporation, you know, KU and all that, their decisions are probably being pushed from the federal level. Okay, so at the federal level, if this is all the, you know, the green energy deal, they're probably getting some incentive to go this route. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out, and Mr. Rice did a great example of this, but I'm going to go back just a tad bit forward, a decade before. I think it was in the 60s, 70s, it was, we're going to run out of oil. That was the scare, the fear tactic. You can Google it and look it up and, and see. That was all over the, the media. And then after that, it was Ice Age. The world's going to freeze. Well, what happened? They didn't freeze, so they had to change something else. So then we went, I don't know if anybody remembers, the uh, ozone layer was going to be depleted. You know, we're all going to die because the ozone is going to be depleted and the sun's going to destroy us. You know, that didn't happen. There was acid rain. The acid rain from the pollution was going to destroy the crops. 
Well, I mean, that's been 30, 40 years ago. That's when I was a kid. I remember reading all that stuff in school and being scared. Oh, gosh, what's going to happen? So then they come up with global warming. Well, that was, you know, it's been on for, for a while. And they found out that the um, uh, polar ice caps sometimes have more ice, sometimes have less. Some years they had ice. Some years we have hotter summers, and some years we have cooler summers. We had a really cold winter not too long ago. So then they change. It's not global warming. It's climate change. So now we're on climate change. Now it's, you know, it's causing all these massive storms. We're having all kinds of storms. We had storms when you guys were young. We just didn't have 24-7 news media and social media constantly putting it in your face to throw it out there. It's always happening. It's just like the vaccine. We changed the definition three times in the process. You can't deny it. It's a fact. They changed the definition. You know, you, it'll prevent it. It'll keep you from getting real sick. Then, it, I mean, it's just it kept on and on and on. I taught science. When I taught science, and I haven't done it in 20 years, but I used to be a science teacher. The definition of vaccine was different than what it is now. So my thing is, you know, if you're looking at this from a, from a, a green thing, then take in all the facts. Let's look at this. What, what are we willing to, to give up? The Ice Age didn't happen. Um, why are all of our wealthy elites building fancy homes, multi-million homes, right by the ocean if the water level is rising? I mean, if you look, our former President Obama built a big old huge complex right on the coast. They all build right on the coast. If, if the water was rising, I wouldn't be building right there. So I just ask you all to take in, take in not just what they tell us the science is, but do your research. Look. Dig into it. Look at the history. You know, they, they keep changing the message is what I'm saying. So if this is going to be from a purely green energy for this company, it's going to get some lucrative incentives from the federal government, then I ask you to vote no. Because all you're going to do is raise the prices on all the hardworking people in this state. You're going to eliminate jobs of people that's in the coal industry. It's going to have a rippling effect. You all have got kids and grandkids. I've got, you know, I've got kids. We've, we've all got families. You know, are they going to live in Kentucky? Or decisions you make, are they going to be, you know, paying much higher energy? If you look at what's happening in Europe, someone mentioned that too. They tried the greens. They didn't work. They started having no power. They're having to go back and, and start up nuclear plants and, and power plants. Um, look, at, look at Texas. Texas had a, a catastrophe with theirs. I mean, they had freezing and nobody had temperatures. Your elderly didn't have, you know, electricity. People froze to death. Dialysis is a big thing here. You know, I've got several family members that are on dialysis. They have no power. You know, what are they going to do? So just take in all that stuff. Look at places that have tried this. Look at what's going on in California. Look at what's going, what happened in Texas with theirs. Look what's going on in Europe. I just ask that you, you know, please just don't take what the experts give you. Research. Thank you very much. Is there anybody that did not sign up to provide uh, public comments and would like to now? I'm Melissa Lewis. I'm from Baxter, Kentucky. I'm a school teacher for the Harlan County School System. And one of the things I was reading that you were supposed to consider, and I hope that you will, is the cost, and not just the dollar amount, but what the cost of shutting down the coal plants will be to my students and to my family. Um, we're already in a poverty-stricken place, and because of the decline in the coal industry, a lot of our students have had to move when the coal industry does bad, then we, uh, everything declines. Everything, even down to the school teachers and the nurses and the doctors, it's a trickle down effect. So consider the effect that um, shutting down and, and people losing their jobs, that the cost isn't just monetary, that the cost can affect families, it can affect students, how they live. Uh, consider, um, my children, I have three sons, they've had to leave. We had the governor over here the other day, and one of the things that was said that we want people in eastern Kentucky to be able to, to leave if they want to, but not because they have to. So consider, the, consider the, everything, not just the monetary value, but the cost, the real cost of families. Thank you. Is there anyone else? 
else? Hi, my name is Mitch Whitaker. I'm the chairman of the Ledger County Republican Party. And uh, I wasn't going to speak today because I thought, uh, you know, I don't have uh, KU energy. I have AEP. Not my problem. Well, on my way over here, I drove across Pine Mountain. I saw one of the finest examples of surface mining that I've ever seen. I saw a coal tipple that was operating, and I saw several coal trucks. I didn't see one solar farm. I didn't see one solar farmer. I didn't see any of that stuff. So when I saw that $208 billion, I thought that was a pretty high price. But to tell you the truth, uh, that's just a fraction of the price. Uh, I think a big part of the price is this gentleman down here that's been coal mining. Uh, you know, you're going to be telling a lot of people in the coal industry, uh, you don't have a job anymore if, uh, if you put through these sort of ESG uh, big government principles of uh, energy savings. So my comment is consider all the costs, uh, especially to the hardworking coal miners in eastern Kentucky. Thank you. I'm Kenny Anderson. I'm a Letcher County Magistrate in District 2. I'm from a little town from called Colson, Kentucky, which was a heavy mining town back in the day until they shut down the mining industry in 2010. There's four big, or two big coal plants within four miles of each other. Uh, my dad was a coal miner. My brother lost his life mining in 2004. My 21-year-old son works at the plant over at Clintwood. You know, it's going to be a smack in the face of these coal miners. And my little town, Electric County, just can't stand no more rate hikes. So I oppose this, and hopefully you all consider all these coal miners and these people that can't afford these, these rate hikes. Thank you. Well. Seeing nobody. Um. How long? One more point I would want to make is I think probably most of the people in this room, we don't believe the global crisis is looming like everybody science says it is. I think if we if it were real and if we demanded that we burn coal, even though we knew it was going to destroy, destroy our planet, we would be terribly wrong. We simply do not believe that. We don't believe we're destroying the planet. I believe the same creator that endowed us with certain inalienable rights. He created the universe. He created this planet. He created this climate. And he governs it. And we don't have any control over it. Thank you, sir. So if there are no other public comments, I just would like to remind everybody before we adjourn that you can provide written comments with uh, following the instructions that are up on the monitors here. Uh, again, you can mail them to the PSC at psc.com at ky.gov. Make sure any public comment that you mail in or email to the PSC has the case number 2022-00402. Um, again, there are additional opportunities to provide public comments. There are me uh, still meetings in Louisville and Madisonville. There's still a virtual public, public comment offering on August the 15th. Instructions to sign up for that are on the PSC website. And then you will be able to either in person or virtually provide public comments before the hearing on August the 22nd at 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, in person would be at 211 Sour Boulevard, Frankfort, Kentucky, in our primary hearing room. Um, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I appreciate uh, everybody's patience with us. Uh, and this public comment session is adjourned. Thank you.